Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series, Six Months of Set Theory and Higher Order Logic. This is Logic 301, Month Number 3, Piano Arithmetic. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the third piano postulate, zero is not the successor of any number. So, the third of Piano's postulates is essentially the claim that zero is not the successor of any number. In other words, zero is the first natural number. So, it is not the case that there exists a class A that has zero as its successor. It's not the case there exists some A such that zero is identical to the successor of A. This is what we're going to be trying to prove. If you want to try it on your own, pause the video now and give it a try. Try to work out the proof yourself. But if not, stay tuned and we're going to walk through it. So this is what our conclusion is going to be. We are going to do an assumed indirect proof, so we're going to assume the contradiction of our conclusion, and we're going to work our way to a contradiction and show that the conclusion must be the case. We will draw the line down. So first off, we're going to existentially instantiate A to be Y, some set Y. So zero is equal to the successor of some set out there Y, and we're going to be spending a lot of time with this set Y to show it's impossible for it to exist. So. First off, we're going to do the definition of successorship. According to our definition of successorship, the successor of a number is equal to the union of that number and the set of that or number, or the set of that set, as the case may be. Next, we're going to do relative union definition. So we have y union, the set of y. We're going to split that out into something we can work with a little bit better. So what that means is for all x, x is a member of 0 is materially equivalent to x is a member of y or x is a member of the set of y. We're going to go ahead and universally instantiate and we're going to universally instantiate x to y. Like I said, we're going to universally instantiate a lot of things to y throughout this. Next, we're going to go ahead and go from premise 5 to premise 6. We'll do our definition of 0. 0 doesn't really help us. The null set is going to help us because we have some definitions of the null set that tell us that there aren't any members of the null set, and so we're going to need to switch that over. But all we've done is define 0 as the null set earlier, so we'll use our 0 definition. Then we're going to go ahead and use uh, equivalence to pull out this if and only if, that triple bar, into a conjunction between two uh, conditionals, one going one direction, one going the other direction. We'll simplify it out to get y is a member of y or y is a member of the set of y implies that y is a member of the null set. Now, by the null set definition, we're pretty confident that there isn't anything that's a member of the null set, which is exactly what this says. For all c, c is not a member of the null set. We'll universally instantiate y to c, and then we will use premise 10 non-member definition to change that non-membership line to uh, negation outside of our y is a member of the null set. Next, we've denied the second half of our conditional in premise 8, so we can use modus tollens to deny the first half of it and get it's not the case that y is a member of y or y is a member of the set of y. Then we'll use De Morgan's law to distribute that negation across our disjunction and change it to a conjunction, getting it's not the case that y is a member of y and it's not the case that y is a member of the set of y. Using simplification, we get it's not the case that y is a member of the set of y. Now, it should be pretty clear at this point how we're going to get to a contradiction because y very clearly is a member of the set whose only member is y. However, it's going to take us a little bit of work to prove that, and that's what we'll do next. So first, we're going to start off with the definition of curly brackets. This is something we did a long time ago back in this set theory series. We have for all G and all H, H is equal to the set of G equals for all I, I as a member of H is materially equivalent to I equals G. We'll universally instantiate Y for G, and we'll universally instantiate the set of Y for H. Next, we're going to use identity, so the set of Y equals the set of Y, to show that the first half of our identity in premise 17 is true, which means we can get rid of that and leave just the second half, saying that for all I, I is a member of the set of Y is materially equivalent to I equals Y. Draw a line down. 
then we will universally instantiate i to y. Once again, like I said, we're universally instantiating a lot of things to y. Once again, with identity, we have y equals y. We'll split out our material equivalents in premise 20 to get uh, y as a member of the set of y implies y equals y, and y equals y implies y as a member of the set of y. We'll simplify that down to y equals y implies that y is a member of the set of y. And then we will use modus ponens with our identity, y equals y, and our conditional in premise 23 to get y is a member of the set of y, something that should seem fairly obvious, but it gives us this contradiction here, that y is both a member of the set of y, and it's not the case that y is a member of the set of y. We have a contradiction that allows us to pull out of our indirect proof and show that it's not the case, there exists some A such that zero is the successor of A. Premise 1 through 25, indirect proof. Up next, we are going to be doing a proof of the principle of mathematical induction. No, you haven't counted wrong. That is jumping over piano postulate number four and jumping to piano postulate number five. As much as the principle of mathematical induction may seem quite complicated, it's actually going to take a lot more work to prove premise or piano postulate number four than it will to prove piano postulate number five. So we're going to jump to piano postulate number five, and then we are going to backtrack and look at uh, several lemas that we need to prove before we can finally prove four. Watch this video and more here at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.